Of he who saw the deep, of he who found out all things, I shall tell the land. Of he who experienced everything, I shall teach the whole. He searched lands everywhere. He who experienced the whole gained complete wisdom. He found out what was secret and uncovered what was hidden. He brought back a tale of the flood, times before the flood. He had journeyed far and wide, weary at last resigned. He engraved all toils on a memorial monument of stone. Those are the opening lines of the standard Babylonian version of the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, the opening lines of the old Babylonian version go like this. Surpassing all other kings, or he was superior to all other kings. A warrior lord of great stature, a hero born of Uruk, a goring wild bull. He marches at the front as a leader. He goes behind support of his brothers. Both of these you read within the standard Babylonian version. Remember that the, uh, the name of the, the text in ancient Mesopotamia would not have been Gilgamesh. Uh, it would have been the first line of the narrative. And the first line of the old Babylonian version is something like surpassing all of the kings. And you have that in the standard Babylonian version on page 51 of Stephanie Dolly's uh, edition uh, in Myths from Mesopotamia. You have the phrase, he, who, he was superior to other kings, a warrior lord of great stature. That is the opening line from the Old Babylonian version, which we know because one of the texts of the Old Babylonian version refers to it by that line. Uh, or, you know, by the line that's a uh, uh, translation of. But the standard Babylonian version refers to itself as he who saw the deep, or he who found out all things, which is the, the first line you have on page 50. And both versions emphasize, as part of his identity, was where he was from and where he was king. The old Babylonian version says, a hero born of Uruk. The standard Babylonian version uh, is more specific, he had the wall of Uruk built, the sheepfold, the holiest uh, Ayana, which is, Ayana is the name of the temple of Ishtar in Uruk. Uh, the pure treasury. See its wall, which is like a copper band. Survey its battlements, which nobody else can match. Take the threshold, which is from time immemorial. Approach Ayana, the home of Ishtar, which no future king nor any man will ever match. Go up to the wall of Uruk and walk around. Inspect the foundation platform and scrutinize the brickwork. Testify that the bricks are baked bricks. The epic begins and ends with these lines, these descriptions of the walls of Uruk. And the walls of Uruk are something we can actually look. We can actually uh, go around and visit. Uh, because buried under the sands of uh, modern-day Iraq uh, is the, the city that gave Iraq its name, Uruk. And they don't look quite as impressive now as they probably did at some point. But this, at one time, was the largest city in the world. In fact, uh, archaeologists describe it as the first city, at least the first large uh, metropolitan area. And it dates back to 3,500 years B.C. Though it's now buried underneath the Iraqi desert, uh, Uruk was once on the, the riverbanks of the Euphrates River. Uh, but, as you can tell by looking at uh, a, a larger map, uh, those rivers have changed course a lot over the years. Frequently they change course in association with a large flood. But those walls, before they were buried, were over 20 feet high, and they were protected by battlements, uh, you know, guard towers. Uh, and the walls went uh, nearly six miles uh, around the city. And not only did they uh, protect the temples and the dwelling places of the people that lived there, they also protected uh, date palm gardens uh, and clay pits. And remember how important the mud bricks are to not only building these walls, but also to making cuneiform tablets, to building uh, uh, works of art that we'll see throughout this uh, presentation. Uh, the walls of Uruk were not the, fall, the first walls built around a city, but they were by far the largest walls that completely encapsulated such a large area. Uh, and the date of these walls co coincides with the time period of a historical king whose name was Gilgamesh, who was mentioned in the ancient cuneiform documents called the Sumerian King Lists. And at that time, Uruk looked something like this. Uh, this is uh, a reconstruction uh, of the, uh, the city with the Temple of Ayana, the Temple of Ishtar, uh, in the, the foreground. And as you can see by looking at the horizon, this is a very flat country. 
there's nothing, no uh, disruption of a flat horizon for uh, as far as the eye can see. So building something as uh, vertical as the Temple of Aeon or the other ziggurats, these these raised temples, uh, is creates a very profound effect to, to people that are used to being in a very flat world. And you would go up these uh, these stairs not only to be closer to the gods, but to get up above your ordinary world. Uh, a principle we'll come back to as we read through the Epic of Gilgamesh. Now, Uruk was not founded by Gilgamesh, but as I said, there was a historical king that's uh, accredited with building these walls. In the year, or around the year 1900 uh, BC, there was a king of Uruk named Anam who uh, inscribed or had inscribed uh, that he restored the walls uh, of Uruk and he restored not only the walls of Uruk, but he says that they're the walls that were built by Gilgamesh or uh, that were emboldened or, or strengthened by Gil Gilgamesh. And the reason this king Gilgamesh seems to have built up these walls was because Uruk, his city, was a smaller, weaker city ruled over by a city called Kish, which was uh, further up the river, uh, about a hundred miles near the later city of Babylon. This is before the rise of Babylon. And uh, Gilgamesh led, the, the, or seems to have led, the forces of Uruk in a battle against Kish, overthrew them, overthrew a king named Akka. And Akka is, is described in a, a narrative uh, with uh, one of the earliest narratives, the Sumerian narratives, uh, where uh, Gilgamesh is described as, as defeating Akka. So all of this seems to come from a very solid kernel of, uh, of a historical person. So if we take a look at our timeline here, uh, we have Sumerian dynasties ruling over Mesopotamia as, as early as 3200 uh, BC. But the rise of uh, city-states is, is a gradual thing. And like I said, Uruk is the, the first of these, these large metropolitan areas. Uh, that's happening between 3200 BCE and 2500 BCE. Uh, during that time, the historical king Gilgamesh would have lived somewhere around tw between 2700 and 2500 BCE. Uh, sometime in what's called the early dynastic, the second early dynastic period. Gilgamesh would have been a Sumerian king, which uh, coming from the, the southern area of Mesopotamia. Uh, after his time uh, time period, the Akkadian king from the city of Akkad, further up the rivers, named uh, Sargon, uh, conquers and, and unites all of Mesopotamia, all these separate city-states. But even after that, even though uh, uh, the, the rulership changes, the language changes, Sumerian is no longer spoken, uh, Akkadian replaces it, and Akkadian is a Semitic language like Hebrew or Arabic. Uh, but even after that, there's so much respect for the, the culture of that time period and respect for Gilgamesh himself that his story continues to be uh, recounted, usually in the original language, uh, at least for a few centuries. Uh, before the uh, Akkadian versions, which you, uh, you read a translation of. The Babylonian versions, both the Old Babylonian version and the Standard Babylonian version, are in Akkadian. But they're translations of uh, fragments of other stories. These other earlier stories we can attribute to a, a king named Shulgi, uh, living around uh, the, the year 2150. Uh, and he commissions... Uh, several narratives to be inscribed on tablets in Sumerian about Gilgamesh. And they're not unified in one epic. We don't yet have the epic of Gilgamesh. We have individual narratives uh, about Gilgamesh that Shulgi commissions. Then sometime between 2000 BC and 1600 BC, uh, across a large time period, we have the creation of the Old Babylonian version of the Epic of Gilgamesh, roughly contemporary with the Old Babylonian version of, of Atrahasis. Uh, and after that, we have what's uh, we describe as the middle versions of the Epic of Gilgamesh. And those are very interesting because uh, even though we don't have enough of them, uh, as much of them as we'd like, we have bits and pieces of them spread all over a huge geographic area. If you look at the letters MV on the map in the bottom right, you see that uh, the, these middle versions of the Epic of Gilgamesh were found as far north uh, as, as Nineveh and actually uh, even further north. But they were found on the coast of the Mediterranean in modern-day Israel, Lebanon, uh, uh, in the city of Megiddo, uh, the city of Ugarit, 
which were major, metro, not as large as Uruk, but they were large and important cities on the trade route between uh, Mesopotamia and Egypt. And we also have the middle versions found as far north as the city of Hattusa. This is where the Hittites are from. Uh, the Hittites had a, a third empire. There was the sort of Babylonian Mesopotamian area of, of empires over a couple thousand years. We all know about ancient Egypt being a very formidable uh, civilization. But people frequently have forgotten about the Hittites, which is another uh, literate and powerful military uh, empire in modern day Turkey, or which was previously called Anatolia. And Hattusa had copies of the Epic of Gilgamesh of the Middle Version. Uh, Ugarit had copies of the Middle Version. Megiddo, um, in, in modern day Israel had uh, copies. So this was a very popular story that was spread very far and wide. And finally, uh, a millennium after the old Babylonian version, the latest old Babylonian versions of the Epic of Gilgamesh and uh, a millennium and a half after Shulgi commissions the, the first written uh, Gilgamesh texts, we have uh, the, the standard Babylonian version. Uh, sometime between uh, 668 and 625 during the reign of Ashurbanipal, uh, a king who was very uh, proactive in trying to preserve a lot of the literary traditions and build up this, uh, these large libraries uh, in his capital city of Nineveh uh, on the Tigris River. Uh, a millennium, uh, over a millennium, this, this epic has been built up and finally becomes the standard Babylonian version, which is most of what you read. Now, I asked you to read both, uh, read a section of the, the standard Babylonian version, and then stop and go back and read what uh, fragments we have of the old Babylonian version in order to try to put the two stories together. And you probably found a lot of words that are shared between the two. So there's a historical kernel of truth, or at least a kernel of fact. There was a historical king named Gilgamesh. There was a, a victory over this uh, city-state of, of Kish. Uh, and this uh, the, the decline of Kish seems to match the rise of Uruk in the archaeological record. But as with anything, legends as well as myths, a uh, historical kernel of truth not only sort of spawns different versions, it also tends to merge with other stories uh, in the oral tradition. And the stories that were told about him, the songs that were sung about him, likely uh, preserve the, the memory of his victory over Kish, uh, his, his uh, exploits on the battlefield, his building of the walls of Uruk. But they also carried on a tradition uh, that doesn't show up quite as, as obvious in the Epic of Gilgamesh as you read it. But Gilgamesh was thought to be a, a judge in the underworld. Uh, there was this whole tradition connected with the, uh, the the lower Mesopotamian religion that saw Gilgamesh as the sort of the Saint Peter. When you died and you went to the underworld, it would be Gilgamesh who sat in judgment over you and decided what happened to you. So we followed that through history from 2600 thereabouts uh, BC to the the standard Babylonian version uh, during the the reign of Ashurbanipal. A lot of things have happened. A lot of uh, fragmentary stories have, have diverged from the original historical uh, uh, fact or the original historical person. And uh, they've uh, sort of diverged and then they've recombined into uh, stories that uh, may or may not be entirely recognizable to the people that lived a few centuries before them. I'll come back to this idea at the end of the uh, talking about the Epic of Gilgamesh when you'll have seen some examples of uh, fragments and, and, and elements within the narrative that don't seem to quite fit. Uh, they won't. Uh, the, it'll be quite obvious that this wasn't a single author uh, publication like a, a modern novel, but there are elements that are coming from somewhere else, and it's not always obvious where those where that somewhere else is. Uh, but like I said, I'll come back to that. And as you can imagine, even during a king's lifetime, his court poets, his courtiers are going to beef up his, his reputation. They're going to exaggerate his exploits. Even if he actually did have impressive exploits, they're going to describe it as if it was almost godlike. And that's while the king is alive. After the king's dead, uh, being remembered a generation, two, three, four generations later, uh, the exploits get larger and larger. Most of the, the specific, uh, you know, incidents might be relatively well preserved but the the king's prowess strength intelligence and this sort of thing get exaggerated and it's similar to what happens in mythology of the gods and remember gilgamesh is uh, two-thirds god i'm not sure how you become two-thirds anything but 
they imagined him, they say in the epic that uh, he's two, two-thirds God, one-third mortal. And his exploits take on this godlike uh, size and, and impressiveness. Uh, and there are works of art uh, f- dating back possibly even before the reign of the historical king that are frequently referred to as Gilgamesh figures. So on the, the top right here, uh, this is a, an impression from a cylinder seal. Uh, and a, the cylinder, the, the actual artifact is the this uh, round cylinder on the uh, in the middle. And you use it to roll over wet clay and it creates the image. And there's this figure you see fighting lions. Frequently you'll see uh, other uh, uh, cylinder seals like this. He's fighting uh, bulls, he's fighting antelopes, uh, he's fighting these monster-like creatures. But you see those uh, six uh, curls, uh, three on either side of his head. Uh, that seems to indicate, uh, or that common image uh, is associated with all of these. And he's this uh, figure has been referred to as the Gilgamesh figure. Now, you know, maybe it's Gilgamesh, maybe it's not. We'll see some cylinder seals that identify the hero as Gilgamesh, but most of them are just like this. They refer to whoever the stamp belongs to, the the seal belongs to, but they include these images that you're just supposed to recognize. Uh, But from the the lifetime of the historical King Gilgamesh all the way down to the time of Ashurbanipal when the standard Babylonian version of Gilgamesh was written, uh, we have uh, the statue on the, the top left that's currently in the Louvre Museum in Paris. Uh, of this gigantic uh, human figure that's holding a lion just to sort of show you the size. This, if you imagine the, the actual size of a lion and um, how big this, this human being would be, uh, I believe the, the statue itself, you can stand under it and it's at least 10 feet tall. Uh, it's about twice my size. So obviously, even if there was a historical Gilgamesh, there wasn't necessarily a historical Humbaba or historical bull of heaven that uh, Gilgamesh and Enkidu had to fight. And in that regard, he's somewhat like a god, but he's also uh, in the description, but also in the evolution of his story, something like a modern comic book character. So let's take the example of the the current uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe uh, incarnation of the god Thor, played by Chris Hemsworth. Uh, Thor, the name, the, the fact that he carries a hammer and all this... Uh, supposedly derives from Norse mythology, and you know a kernel of it does. They're uh, going back at least a, a thousand years. Uh, we have records of stories about a god of thunder who carries this uh, this you know thunder hammer called Mjolnir. Well, that representation changes uh, over the thousand years uh, for which we have uh, art representing him. Uh, it starts off, or at least the, the earliest we have is something like the figure on the left, uh, and that looks very different than this conception that um, the the painters and uh, artists of the the 19th century had in their heads when they represented him as sort of like uh, one of themselves, a, a larger, fiercer, stronger version of a 19th century man, except you know dressed in animal skins and that sort of thing. Uh, well, there's an element of that. There's uh, the the current MCU version of Thor kind of follows in that tradition. He also follows in the Superman tradition. He's a comic book figure, and Marvel was notorious for sort of ripping off DC uh, figures. Um, and he's got the red cape like Superman. He flies through the air like Superman. The, the original Thor did not fly through the air. There's, it's kind of oddly described that his, his chariot can, can go through the, the, the sky, but his hammer didn't fly and he didn't fly. Uh, these are things that the schemas come from the, the DC uh, comics uh, Superman that's been around since 1939. So Superman didn't have anything to do with the Norse god Thor, but we can see with the Marvel version of Thor, these, uh, this, this confluence, this uh, coming together of two uh, schemas uh, and, you know, potentially two scripts. The, the schemas of the, the cape and the flying is a Superman schema. The schema of the, the, the hammer and the, the reference to the Norse gods is the, the Norse schema. This is the same thing that is happening with Gilgamesh. Uh, there's the historical king, there's... Uh, stories about this judge in the underworld. There are these figures of these uh, uh, these heroes that roam around the countryside fighting lions and bulls and that sort of thing. And these things all seem to merge. And once uh, they become a written text, that becomes a, a redaction. And we also have a historical place to, to start this. Uh, there was a, a king named Shulgi who lived between... Uh, uh, 2094 BC and 2047 BC. Shulgi was the king of Ur just down the river. 
uh, from Uruk, but he was very much uh, enamored of this, you know, ancient, uh, possibly ancestor. He claimed to be descended from Gilgamesh, and he described Gilgamesh as like, like a brother uh, to him. And he wanted to model his kingship on Gilgamesh as he understood him from these stories. And in order to make that connection, one of the things he did was become basically the first uh, patron of, of literature. He sponsored uh, scribes, he had scribes uh, write down these oral stories. But of course, not all the oral, oral stories matched. There was a lot of uh, uh, contradictions between one story and another. And you have to make a decision when there's that sort of contradiction. You have to decide, do I try to fit them together and just sort of leave out the part that I think is, is you know, doesn't fit, or do I need to include everything? Uh, and this is what you had to deal with when you uh, read Atrahasis, because Stephanie Dolly gives us everything from these fragments. She doesn't leave out the part about the Sarupu disease in the second uh, fragment. You have to figure out that, oh, well, there's this version and there's this version. Uh, there's one version in which Anu uh, takes the side of the Agigi and says, yes, their their plight was too hard. Then there's another version in which uh, Enki, or Ea, takes the side of the Agigi and says the exact same words. Do you leave out one or the other, or do you include both of them? Shulgi seems to have decided it's better to include everything. He says when he commissions these different Gilgamesh narratives to be written down, not the Epic of Gilgamesh, remember, uh, that comes later, but these individual Gilgamesh narratives, uh, he commissions them to, to be written down uh, on cuneiform or in cuneiform on clay tablets. And he says, quote, I am no fool as regards the knowledge acquired since the time that heaven above set mankind on its path. When I have discovered hymns from past days, old ones from ancient times, I have never declared them to be false, and I have never contradicted their contents. I have conserved these antiquities, never abandoning them, abandoning them to oblivion. So as we learn from the War of the Ghosts example, stories can change when they're recalled, but you also see this desire to have the story retold in the same narrative, the same way, because you don't know where it came from. It, it came from this uh, divine wisdom, and you don't want to change that. So redaction becomes a difficult process, um, but a process in which you include the contradictions uh, instead of trying to decide yourself, what do I leave out? And because we have all these contradicting uh, versions, uh, we end up in the situation that Stephanie Dolly describes in your introduction to uh, her edition of Gilgamesh. She says, our interest lies not only in the story and its characters, but also in the unique opportunity the epic provides for tracing earlier independent folk tales, which were combined in the creation of the whole work. And we can see how the whole work in written form never became fossilized, but was constantly altered through contact with a continuing oral narrative tradition. And we might think, I can go back and find an Ur text and find the story. But no, she says, a new fragment uh, may perplex us rather than elucidating an old problem. In fact, the more text fragments come to light, the harder it becomes to produce the one coherent edition. So as much as we might like to find that Ur text, that single original that preserves the real story, the real Gilgamesh, uh, what we find is just the opposite. If we go further back and we have this gap in the puzzle, we're looking for those puzzle pieces, we're looking for those fragments of, of cuneiform text that would tell us what happened between this part and this part, and we find more fragments, instead of finding the piece that fits real snugly into that, that gap in the puzzle, instead we find more pieces and we don't know where to put them. They contradict the, the pieces we already have. They seem to be doublets. Uh, remember that term, a doublet is retelling the same story but in a different narrative, sometimes with contradictions. So we're never going to find that Ur text. We're never going to find that original version. Instead, what we have is a story that is multiform. Uh, and I'm going to use that, that term the way folklore researchers use it, uh, which is described not just, uh, not, not as an adjective that describes the story, but I, the story is a multiform. It is an, I'm going to use it as a noun, which uh, means there's not the one version, but there's all the versions together as if they were this sort of toolbox or this uh, puzzle set that has pieces from lots of different puzzles, but any individual narrator, any individual poet, any individual uh, scribe who writes it down on cuneiform, uh, who creates one iteration, one one version of that uh, in narrative form, uh, that scribe or that singer has this multi-form uh, box full of pieces to choose from and he or she is only going to choose some of those pieces. But we as scholars, when we read this, have to go back and think, uh, what else is being left out? Is it being left out intentionally? Is it something that has been forgotten at this point in history? 
uh, or is it something that just uh, doesn't fit with this uh, particular iteration's uh, themes and what this particular uh, scribe or redactor finds most important? Because despite Shulgi's best uh, efforts and best intentions, you can't tell a story without leaving things out. You can't tell a story without making, uh, you can't create one iteration uh, in narrative form without making some uh, executive decisions. And if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't have the sort of unified or mostly unified whole that we have in the Epic of Gilgamesh. So notice um, we shift in the old Babylonian version to call it the, the Epic of Gilgamesh rather than just these independent Gilgamesh narratives. And to understand what we mean by that, we have to define the word epic. And you may have had uh, a definition or two. You may have learned some of these characteristics in high school English class. But an epic for our purposes is going to connect to a form as it was described by the ancient Greeks, you know, uh, a century after, at least a century after, the, the latest version, the standard Babylonian version of Gilgamesh, and thousands of years after uh, the oldest versions. Uh, so we're, in, to some extent, uh, imposing a, a, a historically... Uh, non-historical context, a, a schema of what a story should be or a script about uh, that, that should shape this data uh, that doesn't belong. And the Greeks who came up with this definition will be the first to tell us that. But we have to at least be aware that we're doing it. So epic, as we're going to define it, and we're going to read three more epics in here, uh, depending on how you define them, maybe more than three. But it's going to have some of these characteristics. The standard definition of epic is it's a long narrative poem in other words, it tells a story in, as a narrative, but it's also a poem. Uh, it also, uh, you know, pays close attention to the, the scansion, the order of the words and the rhythm. Uh, it's like a song. Uh, it doesn't just tell a story, but it tells a story in poetic form. And it's written in an elevated style, which means it's not the way people talk every day. It's, it's something that sounds very artistic. If you heard somebody speaking, uh, you know, in a particular, if you heard somebody speaking in uh, King James English or Shakespearean English, you would know that that person's not just having a conversation, that person is actually reciting literature. So an epic would be written in an elevated style. It would be presenting characters of high social rank and national importance. This is very important because we're going to come across a narrative much later on that, that defies this tradition. But for the most part, it's going to have a character from the nobility, an aristocrat, maybe a king, maybe somebody who's a part of the royal family almost never, we almost never have mentioned people who were not royalty or, or nobility. And they're going to be in adventures forming an organic whole through their relationship to a central heroic figure and through the, their developments of episodes important to the history of a nation or a people. So it's not just a, an independent story that, you know, people uh, wouldn't have cared about at the time. It's something that uh, the actions of this one person uh, are going to cause an, an entire people, a nation, not in the sense of a nation state, but a nation is in a group of people with a common culture and common language and common identity, uh, are going to rise or fall based on the actions of this one hero. Now, secondary characteristics, uh, typically the, the hero is a, is a imposing physical ability and stature. So like Gilgamesh, if he's large enough to pick up a lion like it's a cat, uh, then this is someone who's clearly imposing uh, physically. Uh, it's also uh, hero of national importance or international importance, as we saw, uh, Gilgamesh is remembered in Uruk for, uh, you know, more than a thousand years, but he's also remembered in these other city states, which are different, uh, na have different national identities. Uh, and he's of historical or legendary significance as a f the founder of the nation. So Uruk wasn't founded by Gilgamesh, but Gilgamesh built the wall and he was their most famous king. Uh, another characteristic is there tends to be a, a journey over a wide geographic setting. Sometimes, to another world, to a supernatural realm, to the underworld, to heaven, or, or something like that. Uh, there's an action consisting of great deeds and overcoming great conflict. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, every narrative is going to have some sort of conflict, but the level, the, the physical conflict, the, the fact that Gilgamesh isn't just up against uh, large monsters, he's up against the gods. Uh, that is about as big a conflict as you're going to get. And uh, because there are gods and monsters, uh, there are supernatural forces that are involved in that action. That's another secondary characteristic. Now, not everything we call an epic is going to have all these characteristics, and Gilgamesh may or may not have every single one of them, but uh, these are enough. There is a sort of, uh, you, you get enough checks on the checklist, and it, people tend to describe it as an epic. 
And we definitely have this, you know, thousand years, more than a thousand years of individual narratives being redacted in and placed into a form, into a schema of what a story should look like uh, according to the people of, uh, of subsequent generations. And it starts to resemble the, the expectations of narrative we still have today. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It has a, a protagonist overcoming conflict in order to achieve a resolution uh, uh, in the end. But notice, even though it's very familiar, uh, that form uh, of a story, that narrativization, it also plays with our expectations and it doesn't give us exactly what we expect, especially in the end. But for the beginning, we have something that is still a staple of, of storytelling, uh, from, from literature to Hollywood movies. And that is, we start with a character exposition. Uh, character exposition is the first time we see a character described in the narrative. And this character exposition is never random. It's never just doing an activity that is not relevant to the rest of the story. Uh, in this case, we have Gilgamesh described as a tyrannical king. He doesn't seem like the protagonist. At least he doesn't seem like a good guy. He doesn't seem like a guy we're going to empathize with. He's described in terms that sound at once like praise, but also uh, are, are very critical. Uh, the narrator tells us on page 52, he had no rival at his puku, and the, your note tells you that puku is this sort of uh, field uh, sport, this uh, uh, athletic competition. Uh, his weapons would rise up, his comrades have to rise up. The young men of Uruk became dejected in their private quarters. And it's a guess as to exactly what this means, but it seems whatever it is, he won't leave them alone. Either he's forcing them into this competition, which uh, causes them uh, injury uh, and uh, to be humiliated, uh, but they have no choice because he's, he's the king. Day and night, his behavior was overbearing. He was the shepherd, and if we fill in the rest of that line with the line that uh, the, the repetition or the refrain further down page 52, uh, powerful, superb, knowledgeable, and expert, uh, Gilgamesh would not leave the young girls alone. Uh, the daughters of warriors, the brides of young men, the gods often heard their complaints. The gods of heaven, the lord of Uruk. Uh, this combination between he is the shepherd of Uruk, the sheepfold. In other words, as a king, he's supposed to be the protector. Uh, the, his people, the people of Uruk are his flock and he's supposed to be protecting them. Yet, he is their shepherd yet, is the, the next line, and even though part of it is broken in both versions of the refrain, it's followed by powerful, superb, and knowledgeable, and expert. Gilgamesh would not leave the young girls alone, the daughters of warriors, the brides of young men. So he's supposed to be protecting people, that's his job as a ruler, but instead he's using his physical uh, uh, power uh, as well as his institutional power uh, to, to force his way on uh, both the young men and the young women. And so the people pray to the gods to do something about him, and that's where the gods come up with uh, the, uh, the creation of Enkidu. Enkidu introduces for Gilgamesh the conflict that's going to be, uh, that's going to change him as an individual. And it may have seemed like Gilgamesh was more of an antagonist than a protagonist up to this point, but if we look at him over the entire uh, epic, over the entire uh, narrative, we see that uh, he goes through this, this huge change. And the first change is introduced very quickly. He goes from being this tyrant to, uh, to being a, a hero in search of a quest. And the thing that require, that is required to disrupt his equilibrium is, uh, is Enkidu. And remember that in narrativization, there's a state of equilibrium at the beginning and something throws that into, uh, into turmoil and that has to be overcome. Well, obviously Gilgamesh has been a source of, of turmoil and of conflict for everyone else, but now the story for him begins because now his conflict begins and forces him to, to react. So this begins what's going to be his character arc. A character arc uh, is the change a character uh, goes through from the beginning of a narrative to the end. And uh, that change is only gonna be brought about if, if the normal world is, is thrown into disarray and that character has to do something about it and grow from it. Um, but how exactly does this work? Well, it involves Enkidu. Now, who is Enkidu? Uh, Enkidu is another character that uh, has his own character art within this narrative, uh, but he also has uh, apparently a backstory uh, outside of the narrative. Uh, there are these figures 
that go back, uh, you know, a thousand years before the standard Babylonian version of, of Gilgamesh that include this figure that has become referred to as the Enkidu figure, or the Eabani figure, uh, another translation of his name, both of which involve the name of the god Enki or Ea, even though the, the Epic of Gilgamesh doesn't tell us anything about a connection between Enkidu, um, between Enkidu and Enki, or Eabani and Ea. But there's this figure of this human-like, uh, or bull-like human, that either has horns or has the, the lower quarters of a, of a bull, uh, but is doing like the Gilgamesh figure on these cylinders. Uh, he's fighting lions. He's uh, sort of, you know, hugging in this uh, this image on the top right. Uh, he's he's uh, fraternizing with with the animals. He's the sort of lord of the animals, or at least the the, the herbivores, the ungulates, the the antelope, the bulls, and that sort of thing. And he's fighting against lions. He's protecting them from lions. So he's a, a man of the wilderness, but not a hunter. He's the one that causes trouble for the hunter. In fact, that's what we see him first doing on page 53, when uh, this young hunter has you know, traps to try to, to kill animals, uh, and Enkidu keeps disarming these traps, and this, this young hunter can't do anything because it's too fearsome uh, uh, an opponent to, to directly uh, confront. But it's ambiguous whether or how Enkidu is imagined in the Epic of Gilgamesh itself. This figure of this uh, you know, half bull, half human, might be the, the forerunner of Enkidu, he might not be. Uh, there's, there's a lot of, of gaps in, in that interpretation, but this is one way to imagine him, especially when he's described as losing his legs when he becomes more civilized. The legs may be this, the, the legs you see in the, in the figure on the top left and the figure in the, the bottom uh, where he's the upper half human, but he has the, the back legs of a, of a bull. Uh, this image on the top right, he looks like a normal human, although clearly he's, he's sort of fraternizing these human-faced bulls. But that image comes from the, the Queen's Lyre, the Queen's Harp that I introduced in a previous lecture. Uh, if you'll notice, if you can see it's not quite big enough, but there are these images on the very front and there, there are other images on the back of this, this harp. So if this harp is being used to tell stories, now being used to sing uh, epics, to sing narratives, and then it makes sense that the images on the front and back uh, of it that, that decorate it are from prominent stories that people would be hearing uh, sung to them while the, the, the singer played this harp. But this is one of those. There is this image of this, this figure that uh, seems to be an Enkidu figure. Now these other two images of uh, Enkidu with the, the features of a bull, the reason that tends to be associated with Enkidu is because it usually is in conjunction with that uh, Gilgamesh figure. So we have some more cylinder seals here, uh, both of which date back to around you know 2200 BC, and we'll have one entirely human figure, the Gilgamesh figure, with the three curls on either side of his head, and we have the the bull man uh, Enkidu uh, or the Enkidu figure. And they're usually fighting lions, or they're fighting, uh, in the case on the bottom, a water buffalo. Uh, later we'll see them uh, fighting the, the, the bull of heaven uh, that, that shows up in the narrative later. So it seems that if this isn't a Gilgamesh figure and not an Enkidu figure, then at least this story, whatever it seems to represent, uh, merges later with Gilgamesh and Enkidu. As these two uh, almost you know superhuman uh, warrior uh, hunter figures that go out and uh, pass the time by fighting with lions and bulls and that sort of thing, the kind of thing that larger than life heroes do. Now right at the beginning he's described as a skybolt of Anu, or sorry, skybolt of Nint uh, Ninurta. And your note, uh, note 10 on page 53, uh, if you follow that, uh, the, the editor Stephanie Daly tells you that that term could mean like a meteor, a, you know, this uh, this meteor thrown across the sky. Um, but it also has these connotations that make us question the relationship between Gilgamesh and Enkidu. The word for the sky bolt or the meteor is Kisru, and it sounds a lot like Kesru, which is the uh, Sumerian or the uh, Akkadian term for a male prostitute. And he's also described as an axe, uh, Hasinu. And there seems to be a play on words with the word asinu, which is a eunuch, a, a male who's been uh, castrated, and took the, the female role in sexual rituals at Ishtar's temple. So this makes us uh, look at the relationship between Gilgamesh and Enkidu as a potentially sexual relationship, although obviously uh, 
we've already uh, read that Gilgamesh was a sexual threat, a sexual predator toward uh, the young women of, uh, of Uruk. And later we're going to read about uh, the, the, the sacred prostitute uh, Shamhat uh, and the fact that they made love for uh, uh, seven days and six nights. So even if there is this uh, implication of a sexual relationship between the two, Again, it doesn't fit our modern uh, schemas about uh, either homosexuality or heterosexuality. Uh, it seems to just be hypersexuality in, in both of their cases. And the role of sexuality generally in this narrative and in these other uh, contributing narratives uh, also doesn't resemble our, our modern schema. So why was Shamhat sent out to Enkidu? Why was this Gilgamesh's solution? Uh, it seemed that part of his plan all along uh, was this knowledge that uh, having this sexual relationship with Shamhat would civilize him, would turn him from this, this wild man into this civilized man. And it does, it doesn't all happen immediately, but this begins Enkidu's transition uh, and potentially the conflict, at least he's gonna you know, curse her later for, for bringing him into civilization. Gilgamesh seems aware on the bottom of 54, or the top of 55, when he says uh, to the, the young hunter that uh, if we send Shamhat, uh, he, Enkidu, will see her and get close to her. Then his cattle, who have grown, grown up in open country with him, will become alien to him. And so she goes and presents herself to Enkidu out in the wilderness. And when he was sated with her charms, he set his face toward open country of his cattle. In other words, he's... Uh, after a week of uh, lovemaking, he's gotten all he wants and he thinks he's gonna turn around and go home. But when he set his face towards the open country of his cattle, the gazelles saw Enkidu and scattered. The cattle of the open country uh, kept away from his body. For Enkidu had stripped, uh, his body was too clean. His legs, which he used to keep pace with his cattle, were at a standstill. Uh, Enkidu had been diminished, so he could not run as before. Yet he had acquired judgment and had become wiser. In other words, he no longer is you know, covered in fur if, if he had a, this bull body before. And he doesn't have the bull leg that could run so quickly anymore. In other words, he has been converted from the sort of bull man into a, a complete human. And he's become physically weaker, but he's become wiser like a human, less, uh, less like an animal. Uh, he had acquired judgment, become wiser. And so when the animals run away from him, he turns back towards Shamhat, and Shamhat says to him, you have become profound, Enkidu. You have become like a god. Uh, this line will come across again in, in, a, in a recognizable form in another text. But notice this dichotomy. Uh, there's uh, this sort of sexual initiation that takes this animal man and turns him into a civilized man, uh, or at least begins that journey. So she tells him, come let me take you into Uruk, the sheepfold to the pure house, the dwelling of Anu and Ishtar, where Gilgamesh is perfect in strength and is like a wild bull, ironic in that Enkidu is no more like a wild bull. Uh, uh, but Gilgamesh is like a wild bull, more powerful than any of the people. And it says, knowing his own mind now, he would seek for a friend. Uh, so we, we have the first description of his motivation to go with her. He's looking for a friend, an equal. Uh, Enkidu spoke to her, to the harlot, Come, Shamhat, invite me to the pure house, the holy dwelling of Anu and Ishtar, where Gilgamesh is perfect in strength and is like a wild bull, more powerful than the people. You know, the same refrain, which in a, when being sung would, would uh, be appropriate, although it may get repetitive when we have to read it over and over again. But then he says, Let me challenge him. In Uruk, I shall be the strongest. I shall go in and alter destiny. One who is born in open country has superior strength. Uh, we get the uh, the urban versus rural uh, clash. Before he goes into the city, he's uh, he's going in as uh, with you know conflict on his mind, with uh, this feeling of insecurity maybe that he needs to prove himself uh, as being superior to the uh, the king of the city. And incidentally, Texans, before you go saying, "Yeah, I'm like him. I'm a country boy." Remember, he was the enemy of the hunters, so you kind of have to choose. Uh, but he goes toward. Uh, the city, and as they're going toward the city, Shamhash is telling him uh, what to expect in the city, how the people look, what they do, and she, she continues to describe Gilgamesh, and notice she describes him as, uh, he does not sleep by day or night. This is something that's going to change when we get to, to book 11, but uh, she describes Gilgamesh specifically by the fact he doesn't sleep. 
And the irony follows immediately after that when we're told that at the same time uh, that Shamhat and Enkidu are making their way toward the city, at the same time Shamhat is telling Enkidu that Gilgamesh doesn't sleep, Gilgamesh is asleep, and he has a dream about uh, Enkidu. And in that dream, Gilgamesh says uh, to his mother, the, the goddess uh, Ninsun, uh, Mother, I saw uh, a dream in the night. There were stars in the sky for me, and something like a sky bolt of Anu. And remember the, the term there, um, having the, the double meaning. And over on page 58, I loved it as a wife, doted on it, I carried it and laid it at your feet. Uh, Ninsun repeats the refrain, you know, sings the next chorus of the song uh, again, but in when she does it, she's explaining to him who this person is. This person will be like a wife. This person will be like a sky bolt of Anu. Uh, you will love him like a wife and you will dote on him. And he will always keep you safe. This is the, the meaning of your dream. So at least he knows that someone is, is on the way that will be this sort of partner for him. And that concludes the first tablet on uh, page 59. Then we get to tablet uh, two of the standard Babylonian version, and we have kind of a broken up story. And this is where I asked you to read the rest of that tablet and then stop and go back and read, or actually I asked you to read uh, the, the first two tablets. But tablet two uh, has enough of us to sort of figure out that uh, Enkidu arrives in Uruk, uh, something about putting food in front of him, something about slew wolves, something about the, sh the shepherd's hut. Uh, then Enkidu blocks the father-in-law's house. Uh, and there's some sort of wrestling in the streets between Enkidu and, and Gilgamesh. And then everybody's crying. And you're probably wondering what, what just happened. Uh, and 29 lines are missing after that. And not only do we, the, the tablet that Stephanie Dolly has to translate here, not only is that broken up, but even within that tablet, if you look on page 62 toward the bottom, uh, there's in parentheses the new break, uh, ellipses dot dot dot, new break. That was actually written by the scribe to say that his source, or her source, uh, was also broken. Uh, so if you follow the note to, to uh, note 23, you find that even the this scribes, this uh, in, in Ashurbanipal's time, the scribe who's writing this tablet has a tablet in which there's a break, and rather than just skipping over it, the scribe wants to know, note that uh, there is a break here, so that's why I'm missing something. And then the, the counselors of Uruk are telling Gilgamesh something about Humbaba, asking him not to go, but uh, then we have the, the end of the tablet. So we don't have much to tablet two in this uh, standard Babylonian version. And that's why your assignment was to read the first two tablets, uh, pages 50 to 61, and then go back to uh, the old Babylonian version in which uh, you're re you read tablet one through three, but your tablet two is a little bit more substantive. Uh, so whereas when you read Atrahasa, Stephanie Dolly took the, the old Babylonian version, which was the more complete, and had you read most of it, but then she would switch to SBV in the middle and then come back to the OBV at the end. Now she's separated them out, so you have to be the one to redact it. You have to sort of keep these things in mind as you go back from one to the other and try to fill in the gaps. So what you're doing is comparing the standard Babylonian version, uh, which in this one tablet is less complete. Normally it's much more complete than the old Babylonian version, but in this case, uh, the, the tablet you see on the left uh, is actually two sides of the same tablet uh, that I've just uh, flipped over. But this is uh, the sort of broken tablet two from the standard Babylonian version uh, that dates from around 600 BCE. And on the right, you have the older one, the thousand years older, uh, actually, you know, maybe uh, 1400 years uh, older. And that's the, uh, what's called the Philadelphia tablet. And as you can see, it's a lot more complete. There's a few breaks, but uh, we can still uh, see that there's a lot more cuneiform text surviving. And so what you have to do is actually uh, take the two together, at least the translations of the two, and try to make them make more sense. So in these two columns, on the left you have the standard Babylonian version, which you have in your book on pages 59 to 60, and on the right you have the old Babylonian version from pages 138 to 139. So again, this is Enkidu and Shamhat are on their way from the wilderness, the, the far wilderness, to the you know, largest city in the world, the, the first sort of major metropolitan area in the world. And 
in this, they're going between the two, and it's a gradual process, but you wouldn't know what's happening just to look at Tablet 2. So Tablet 2, we have this. Ikidu was seated before her in Toronto, something about tears, trusted someone, why something. They were consulting together by themselves at his decision, who understood his heart, which shamhat, something, something about a garment, something about a second garment. Uh, but if you take that the, those uh, references to a garment and a second garment, and you flip over to 138, you see, uh, oh, okay, she took off her garments and clothed him, clothed Enkidu, in a second garment, took his hand like a goddess, led him to the shepherd's hut, which was uh, w which there was a, a sheep pen. And then while they're at the shepherd's hut, uh, keep in mind, this is halfway between the wilderness and the city. We're in the, the rural area, the farming, the agricultural, the pastoral area, where uh, there are shepherds, and they're not in you know clay brick buildings yet, but they're in a hut. So he's halfway from the, between the wilderness and the civilization. And the shepherds gather over him, but then of course we have a gap of four or five lines in the old Babylonian version. But now we can switch back over. We take that uh, that line, the shepherds gathered over him, and we see the same line in the standard Babylonian version, so we use that to fill in the old Babylonian version. Okay, the shepherds gathered over him of their own accord, and by themselves, the young men, how like Gilgamesh in, in build, uh, sorry, the, the, the shepherds were saying, the young man, how like Gilgamesh in build, mature in build, and sturdy as battlements, as, as sturdy as a tower, as a fortress. Uh, why was he born in the mountains? He is just as powerful in strength in his arms as the sky bolt of Anu. So, they're gathering around him. This is what Gilgamesh foresaw in his dream that we just saw uh, from uh, Tablet uh, uh, 1. Uh, they're gathering around him and admiring how big a guy he is and how uh, you know formidable he appears to be. Uh, and so they put food in front of him. They put drink in front of him. But he's still a little bit wild. He hasn't made that transition yet, so he would not eat the food. He narrowed his eyes and stared. In other words, he looks at it and thinks, this isn't food. Remember, he's been eating grass. Uh, he's been drinking directly from uh, the rivers and streams. So this doesn't this is, doesn't fit his idea of food. This is baked bread, uh, which we know if, if we flip back over to the old Babylonian version. Uh, so he used to suck the milk of wild animals. They put food in front of him. He narrowed his eyes, looked, then stared. Iki knew, knew nothing of eating uh, bread or drinking beer. So beer, civilization. Bread, civilization. You can't uh, find beer or bread uh, you know, uh, out in the in the wilderness. This takes some uh, coordinated human effort. This takes infrastructure. Uh, this takes a you know a community of people with various expertise in various things in order to uh, grow the the wheat, uh, harvest the wheat, uh, mill the wheat, bake the 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 flour. So uh, this is sort of a step by step towards civilization. And the first thing is uh, what he uh, is regards as food, what fits his schema. So Enkidu has to change his schema for what food and what drink is uh, in order to make his way into civilization. So he had never learned, and the harlot made her voice heard and spoke to Enkidu. Eat the food, Enkidu, the symbol of life. So not just something that will sustain you, but the symbol of life, this represents life. Uh, drink the beer, the destiny of the land. Well, that can mean a couple of things in our modern schema, but it, clearly it's a good thing for, their, uh, for, for them. Enkidu ate the bread until he had had enough. He drank the beer, seven whole jars. He's off to a good start. Relaxed, felt joyful. His heart rejoiced, his face beamed. He smeared himself with something. Uh, uh, his body was hairy, he anointed himself with oil. It became like any man, put on clothes. He was like a warrior, took his weapon. So what he's doing now that he's, uh, his sort of fur, his animal fur has dropped off, uh, his, uh, you know, animal legs have been replaced by human legs. Now he's starting to groom himself and bathe himself and, uh, and dress like a, a civilized human. And this also helps us fill in the gaps about what he was doing. So apparently he spent some time at the, the shepherd's hut, uh, but we don't really know what if we just look at tablet two. Tablet two has too many gaps. Something about he slew wolves, something about the herdsman, something about Uruk the sheepfold, and then there's a longer gap. But if we look at the old Babylonian version, we know, oh, uh, he was fighting with lions. Uh, the shepherds could rest at night. In other words, their flocks were safe because he was killing lions, he was killing wolves. Um, uh, the older herdsmen lay down, Enkidu was their guard, a man awake. Uh, so again, this uh, imagery about you know being alive, being awake, being uh, a formidable uh, uh, individual, uh, depending on how awake you are. 
And finally, we have a few more clues about what exactly uh, Enkidu's motiv motivation was. And what uh, we had hints of at the very beginning about the practice that Gilgamesh had of uh, harassing the young women of, of Uruk. On page 139 uh, in the Old Babylonian version, we are introduced to this uh, person who comes to the uh, the shepherd's hut on his way to uh, a wedding. Uh, Shamhat, or in the Old Babylonian version, Shamkat. Uh, and Enkidu questioned this young man, and he tells them, they have invited me to the houses of the fathers-in-law. It is the people's destiny for choosing daughters-in-law. I fill the table of ceremonies with delightful food for the father-in-law's city. So we have a wedding planner, someone involved in, in preparing weddings. But for the king of spacious Uruk, open the something of people for bridegrooms. For Gilgamesh, the king of spacious Uruk, open the something of people for, for bridegrooms. He will impregnate the destined wife. He first, the husband afterwards. Uh, so we have a prima nocti, this uh, ritual where the, the king, uh, the, the overlord, uh, gets to sleep with the bride on her wedding night before the, her, her husband does. And this seems to not go over well with Enkidu. Uh, at the, the word of the young man, his face went livid. And so that is where the confrontation happens. When he finally gets to Uruk, uh, Enkidu places himself in the, the door of the father's house. So back on page 60 in the standard Babylonian version, we have now some more idea about what is actually happening here. We're told that Enkidu blocked his access at the door of the father-in-law's house. What did that mean? Well, now we know. This is the father of the bride. So in other words, this house is where the bride lives. Gilgamesh is on his way to uh, force himself on the bride on her wedding night. But now Enkidu has stepped in, literally blocking the door so that he can't do that. And that's where the fight be between them begins. And so now we have these two supernaturally strong uh, warriors wrestling with each other through uh, throughout the city. And uh, they're sort of knocking the, the walls down. The walls shook, they demolished the door frame. Uh, so they fight for a while and then um, we have uh, this realization that Gilgamesh realizes this is the, the person he had the, the dream about. This is the sky bolt of Anu that he would love like a wife. And that's when he, he breaks down crying. And tablet two of the old Babylonian version ends, notice on page 141, by naming itself as second tablet of, quote, he was superior to other kings, end quote. So this is that, that catch line that lets us know that this is the, the second tablet of this longer multi-tablet series, which is titled, He Who Surpasses Other Kings, which was the, the original title of the Old Babylonian version. And that allows us to uh, connect that with that same line in the standard Babylonian version, something like, He Was Superior to All Other Kings, and let us know that the tablet one of the standard Babylonian version added more to the beginning uh, than the original Old Babylonian version had. So now the two sort of co-heroes are, are united. They're, uh, they're no longer in opposition. And more importantly, now Gilgamesh can focus his attention on doing something other than harassing his people. Uh, and uh, now that they've sort of realized that uh, they're both these sort of, uh, other than each other, uh, nobody can match them, uh, they decide to go off and find a, a bigger target, a, a new enemy to, to, to fight with. And that is uh, Humbaba, the, the guardian of the cedar forest. So they begin their journey to the cedar forest, or in, in Dali's translation, it's the pine forest. Um, and the uh, obvious uh, motive seems to be to face this new challenge. Uh, and the village, or the, the city elders uh, advise them not to go, uh, but uh, Gilgamesh tells them and tells his mother, Ninsun, that his, his mind is made up. And Ninsun goes up to the top of uh, her house. Notice that even she, a goddess, to talk to Shamhash, uh, goes up on top of her house. She has to get up above the, the everyday world uh, and make a sacrifice, burning a, a sacrificial offering to Shamhash, the sun god, uh, even though he's a fellow god. So she goes up high, she makes a, a burnt offering. That's how she gets the attention of Shamhash, the sun god. And she you know, asks him to look after her son because he has a, a restless spirit. 
And uh, that's a translation in the original uh, uh, Akkadian. It's uh, literally he has a spirit that cannot sleep. And of course that's gonna be ironic later on when sleep is the one thing he can't avoid doing. But right now, uh, there's a lot of play on uh, the, his, ability, his inability to sleep, his restlessness. And that's what's driving him, that's what's motivating him. The description of Humbaba is, uh, is pretty, pretty ferocious. Uh, whose shout is the flood weapon, whose utterance is fire, whose breath is death, uh, can hear for a distance of 60 leagues uh, through, through the forest, so who can penetrate this forest? Uh, so he's, uh, Gilgamesh and Enkidu have been warned, this is not someone you want to, uh, to tangle with, and that seems to be the very motivation for them to do it. You know, no one, who else on earth could take the two of us on together? Let's go uh, tackle this, uh, this unbeatable monster. But there's also a more uh, basic economic motivation to this quest, and that is, remember that in Uruk and in Mesopotamia, uh, the primary building material is mud brick. And you can stack up mud bricks and you can build pyramids, you can build these impressive ziggurats that stand up like, like man-made mountains. You can build these impressive walls. But where mud brick tends to not be such a great building material is when you wanna put a roof on something. Uh, you wanna put a roof on something and the first rain is gonna put too much weight and the, the mud brick is gonna collapse under its own weight. So you need wood to uh, go inside the, the mud. You need to have this sort of support, this wooden frame in order to build any kind of you know sturdy uh, ceiling or elevated floor. So that's something that does not grow very well uh, in, in Mesopotamia. We have these reed swamps and they can take these reeds and they can make these sort of arched uh, roofs like we saw in Atrahasis, but they can't make a flat uh, ceiling that, would, that you'd be able to walk on top of without wood. And there's no wood that's large enough and strong enough anywhere near any of these cities in the, the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley. So in the older sources, and it's, it's ambiguous in the Old Babylonian version, but in the, the earlier uh, versions that go back before the Old Babylonian versions, uh, they're described as going up into the Zagros Mountains. And as you see on the map here, the, the Zagros Mountains are to the northeast. And that's quite a trip. You've gotta you know, go up the Tigris uh, River a bit and then uh, up into these mountains. And that's where most of Mesopotamia went during these early, dages, early stage of, of civilization, you know, up to the, the time period around 2000 BC. But because there was such a huge population all going to the same area to, uh, to cut down the trees and bring them back, that completely deforested the area. So after a while, they had to give up on the Zagros Mountains and they had to go all the way to Lebanon. And you see how far that is uh, to the northwest. They had to go up the Euphrates River and keep in mind, uh, all of this area is the Arabian Desert. They can't just go straight across this. They have to go up, follow the Fertile Crescent, uh, which is crescent shape, which you know we've got Egypt over here, we've got Israel here. Uh, this area here, has enough sort of balance between you know uh, arable land and water and that sort of thing that it's uh, it, it, it's manageable. So uh, Enkidu and Gilgamesh have to go up the Euphrates River in the standard Babylonian version to go to Lebanon. And in these mountains here, there are, are cedar trees, and that's why even the the modern nation of of Lebanon has uh, the, the cedar tree on its flag. Uh, so this is some of the finest uh, timber for building, but notice how far the, the trek is. So we've got a bit of a, an ideology of uh, where this uh, you know, source for timber uh, came from. So if you're here in Uruk and you need to get uh, timber, you need to go where the timber is. But notice in those uh, two different narratives, the location of Humbaba changes to fit wherever they're going at that time. To, to get the trees they need for resources. In the early accounts, Humbaba's over here, this is where they're going for trees, and later accounts, he's over here, this is where they're going for trees. Now, who is Humbaba? Now, clearly, this is the archetypal monster. If you got heroes, they need monsters to fight in our typical uh, uh, story, and this is the script we're most familiar with. Uh, larger than life heroes need larger than life monsters to bring larger than life conflict and, uh, and, and win the, the fame or whatever it is they're, they're, they're seeking. And Humbaba fits this nicely as it's described in the standard Babylonian versions and, and more fragmentarily in the, the old Babylonian versions. But I asked you to do, go yet another step in analyzing this, uh, uh, this part of the narrative and that is I asked you to read about uh, a newly discovered tablet uh, 
that covers this uh, this element, this uh, fight between uh, the, the the duo of uh, Enkidu and, and Gogamesh and the the monster Humbaba. And because this uh, this fight between these you know the world's greatest heroes and the world's biggest monster fit that uh, archetype, uh, fit that script, uh, this story is uh, represented around a wide geographic area. Uh, the image on the left, the carving on the left, comes from uh, the area of modern day Syria, and it was a Hittite uh, version of the that middle version of the the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, and depicts uh, you know this monster being you know uh, bound by these uh, two heroes. Uh, elsewhere, there's the, the lots of different uh, depictions on cylinder seals from all over Mesopotamia, but uh, it's uh, widely represented, and there's also a lot of these uh, Humbaba masks, it's not actually a mask, but it's like a, um, a depiction of Humbaba's head, which is imagined as having these like, you know, intestinal, like, you know, disgusting features on the outside of it. And there's several different variations uh, on this theme. But it makes a good story, if you like the hero stories, it's this sort of comic book, uh, you know, superhero versus, or two superheroes versus this uh, super monster villain, uh, in the version that, that you read. And that's the way it was interpreted for the last uh, century of uh, people studying Gilgamesh and uh, studying in particular this uh, this episode. But just a few years ago, we had a translation of a, a tablet that, that you know had been sort of uh, took a while to, to catch up with the rest of this narrative, and that actually fills in some of the gaps that we didn't even expect uh, were there. The the kinds of things that we did not expect. The the kind of uh, new tablet that uh, Stephanie Dolly mentioned that doesn't actually fill in a gap we expected, it actually opens up a, a bunch of new questions. And that is the, 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 the tablet I asked you to, to read, uh, uh, the translation and a description of the, the discovery of this tablet. So in this new, uh, the, the article you read about the, the fragment and the translation of the fragment itself, we get something that clearly fits directly into uh, the tablet five because it has a catch line. It has some of the same words uh, from from lines of the standard Babylonian version uh, that we've had for a few years. But then what follows after that is not the kind of thing we may have expected, especially if we're thinking of Humbaba as this just pure evil monster who's evil for the sake of being evil. Uh, instead, we get indications that uh, he's this sort of lord of the uh, of animals, very similar to, to Enkidu, uh, a protector of animals. He's been placed there by Elil or Enlil uh, to guard the cedar forest, not just the, the resources uh, of the cedar trees, but also this whole uh, kingdom, this natural world that's there. And there are descriptions of uh, monkeys and birds and, and all of this, uh, this uh, in the, the words of the, the translators, uh, Al Rawi and, and George, uh, they say, quote, there's this abundance of exotic, costly materials in fabulous lands, uh, which is a common literary, literary motif. Perhaps more surprising is the revelation that the cedar forest was in Babylonian literary imagination, a dense jungle inhabited by exotic and noisy fauna, in lines 17 through 26. Uh, chatter of monkeys, chorus of cicada, and squawking of many kinds of birds formed a symphony or cacophony of, uh, that daily entertained the forest guardian, Humbaba. The passage gives a context for the simile like musicians that occurs very uh, in very broken context in the Hittite version of Gilgamesh and Enkidu's arrival at the Cedar Forest. Humbaba's uh, jungle orchestra evokes those images found in the ancient Near Eastern art of animals playing musical instruments. Humbaba emerges not as a barbarian ogre, but as a foreign ruler entertained with music at the court in the manner of a Babylonian king but the music uh, of a more exotic kind played by a band of equally exotic musicians, end quote. And uh, they, they go on to point out that these lines 61 through 72, uh, even though they're broken, seem to indicate that uh, Enkidu has been here before. Uh, just as you know, Enkidu was a sort of protector of animals from hunters, uh, so too uh, it appears that, that Humbaba was, and it seems that they have a sort of past history. And so uh, the, the translators, Al Rawi and George, say, quote, another passage, uh, 61 through 72, though consisting only of half lines, seems to confirm the point already known from an, another manuscript that Enkidu had spent time with Humbaba in his youth. Humbaba, having become aware of the presence of intruders in his domain, appears to guess that it must be Enkidu returned home. 
Uh, perhaps he might even be excited by the thought of a, of a coming reunion. If it is right to read these fragmentary lines, uh, a tender reference to earlier life together, then Humbaba's subsequent betrayal by Enkidu, uh, who has brought with him a hostile alien, the King Gilgamesh, becomes even more poignant, end quote. So what happens, uh, this, this character, this monster, in, in, uh, in a fragmentary version, we might interpret uh, this as this, you know, clearly this fight with this monster, tends to be uh, basically just a battle over resources. Uh, Humbaba wants to protect the cedar forest. Uh, Gilgamesh wants to to take the the cedar, uh, and uh, Enkidu has to choose sides. And now he's made friends with Gilgamesh, so he's actually helping his new friend against his old friend. Uh, this is one interpretation. Now again, uh, even with this new fragment, we still have broken pieces, so it's it's hard to tell. But there is at least two different potential ways to read uh, two two different scripts we can impose on this same text. Uh, the, the same narrative as it is. And then there's this moment of regret when they look around and see what they've done. So we have uh, the this huge horrendous fight between the, the two heroes and, and Humbaba, uh, this very destructive fight. We have threats on both sides. You know, Humbaba's still, you know, telling them he's going to, you know, uh, you know bite their throats like a, like a lion. Uh, he's gonna, you know, tear them apart. Uh, but he's at the same time sort of threatening them to stay away, but also, you know, pleading with them to stay away. And it's clear that, uh, uh, Enkidu is kind of egging on Gilgamesh, even as, as, as Gilgamesh is kind of afraid to, uh, to go in for the kill. Enkidu realizes that he's locked in. He can't undo this. The best thing they can do is just to go ahead and finish off, uh, Humbaba. And then afterwards, there's this, this regret. He says, you know, my friend, we have reduced the forest to a wasteland. How shall we answer Enlil in Nippur? Uh, because Enlil, the god, had a, a, a temple in Nippur. Uh, in your, in your might slew the guardian. Uh, what was this wrath of yours that you went trampling the forest? Uh, so they have to sort of reconcile themselves with what they've just done. They have these new resources, and the way Enkidu seems to need to uh, atone for what he's done is to build a, a gate uh, f uh, in honor of uh, Enlil, and he's gonna use these timbers that they uh, float down the river. Uh, he's gonna use that to, you know, uh, as the, the support for a, uh, a mud brick uh, gate that will be, you know, the sort of uh, sacrifice or this offering uh, that will commemorate Enlil. Hopefully now that Enlil's guardian, appointed guardian, Humbaba has been killed, this is one way to appease them. But as we're going to see, there are going to be a lot of consequences of this, both in the, the action itself, killing Humbaba, but also in the sort of place this takes uh, Enkidu and Gilgamesh, uh, the place it takes their egos. So now that you've come this far, um, this is the by far the most actual redaction you'll have to do uh, in your own head and sort of uh, put together yourself. Uh, the, your next assignment is to continue on with tablets 6 through 12 in the standard Babylonian version. So you don't have to flip back and forth and you don't have any other, uh, once you've read the Al-Rawi uh, and George uh, translation of the, the new tablet 5 fragment, uh, as well as the Old Babylonian version, Standard Babylonian version, up to Tablet 5. Now, from Tablet 6 to 12, you don't have to flip back and forth. But, you're going to find that there are some things that still don't quite make sense. Everything after this comes from the Standard Babylonian version, and yet, if you take some of the principles that we've applied, or that we've found, uh, from reading what we knew to be redactions, and you look at what you read in the, the rest of the Epic of Gilgamesh, you're gonna see there are still some cracks, there's still some seams, there's still some indications that this is not one coherent uh, uh, narrative. This is, this is itself the product of redaction. But I'll leave that to you to figure out, and then we'll talk about it uh, afterwards.